Hello and welcome to Twinsburg Public Library's webinars. Today we're going to be talking about copyright and the library. This particular webinar should not last very long. It's only going to be about 20 to 30 minutes with some times for questions. I just want to give you some basic understanding of copyright and the library's role with copyright. With that being said, let me give you a disclaimer. I am not a lawyer. I cannot interpret the law. I cannot offer legal advice when it comes to copyright law. So what this webinar is designed for is to give you a framework of understanding for how the library um, interacts with copyright law, our role in it, how we um, lend, materi ma lend materials, things of that nature. So this is from a librarian's perspective, not from a lawyer. If you have a specific question related to copyright law, or if you need legal advice, please consult a licensed attorney in your area. So generally, how does copyright work? So copyright is actually in the Constitution, and there is an entire office, if you actually go to copyright.gov, dedicated to preserving and making copyright work. Its original intentions were to protect content creators from theft or infringement so that they can actually earn um, revenue off of their hard work. And it also is intended to encourage investing. So if I invest in an artist, if I patron an artist, then I stand a chance to benefit from it as well. And it helps provide, or at least it was intended to provide, balance between creators, copyright owners, and the general public. The general public benefits from copyright because there are protections so that we have access to these materials. Um, the Fair Use Clause in specific is something that is in, that's cited a lot for research, educational use, study. Um, a lot of teachers rely on this so that we can actually teach culture and continue learning about Mark Twain and different bodies of work. So we're going to look at a couple of different models. First we'll look at some software patent models and then we'll look at some artistic copyright models just to kind of see how the different copyright ideas and ideology works together. So if we look at, for example, the software patent models, we have three main ideologies, proprietary, open, and freeware. You'll notice that freeware is kind of connected with both open and proprietary and kind of its own thing. It's not a traditional Venn diagram because the three do share common properties, but they're not exactly interconnected. So in the proprietary side, you are licensed to use software, you are licensed to use their work. Normally it costs money to obtain these licenses. Occasionally um, they might have free trials or, this, or, or such. You have ensured quality so that if the software doesn't work, you have someone to contact to fix it for you. You have someone who is going to actually make sure the, it, the program does what is it intended to do. You also have support, which goes along with ensured quality. So if it does break, there is someone who can actually fix it for you. There is someone who, who will respond to your inquiry. On the far other end of the spectrum, we have open. Open software, anyone can use, download, or modify. So the code is available. And if you want to change it, you can change it. If you want to um, just use it, you can just use it. Usually open software is free. The quality is not insured. It's very much a use at your own risk. It's there for you for free, but you, um, it may or may not work for you, and that's something that you'll just have to figure out after you've already experienced it. And typically, there's no support. There's no one individual that will respond directly to your inquiry. However, there is usually community um, discussion boards, community support, so that way if you have a problem, you can post a question on a forum and other members of the community who help build the code would actually respond and maybe try to help you fix the problem, but again, there's no insured quality, there's no guaranteed support. 
and the third model is freeware. So typically freeware can be proprietary, but it's a lot, but you can use it for free. So Google Docs is a great example. Um, you can use Google Docs for free, have your own spreadsheets and, and your own documents, but it's free. Freeware, you may have little to no support. It's also very difficult to get to Google if you have an issue with Google Docs. They do also have a community set up similar to open source. So if you want to go onto their discussion boards, discussion boards and forums, you can post a question and hopefully someone who's well versed in it will respond to you. Occasionally, someone who's actually from Google may respond to you. So freeware is very similar to that, where you can use the services for free, but you are agreeing to a license term. It's usually proprietary software, so you cannot download the, soft, uh, the code and change or modify. And it really had little to no support. There's really no 1-800 number you can call or no email address that you can just send an inquiry to. So those are the three main differences in the software patent models when it comes to um, copyright. The other set for models would be um, copyright, traditional copyright, and Creative Commons copyright. So we're going to look at artistic models with music, literature, you name it. So with copyright, this is what's been around since the beginning of the country and beforehand where you are um, adding copyright protection to your work so it's designed to protect the content creators and are the owners of the copyright um, license. It's supposed to also balance the right of the owners with the right of the public to access because the way the law was set up, it, they did recognize that it's important that the public has access to this knowledge, otherwise innovation cannot occur. If everyone hoarded the knowledge or the artist um, hoarded their own music or novels to themselves, it won't be able to be spread amongst the public, people can't build upon it, there was no innovation, there's no creativity. And it's all part of culture, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, later. So there is actually a side to copyright that does protect the public's right to access the material. It's not just protecting the content creators. The newer model of copyright is something called Creative Commons. Creative Commons was born of the internet age. It was born of the sharing culture. So the new sharing economy or the new sharing culture is basically where people decide I'm going to create something and I'm going to give it freely or with limited restraints to other members of the public so that they can use it to create something. And you know, you'll notice it's kind of similar to the idea of the open source uh, patent model for software. It's this idea that I create so that the community can benefit as a whole. You create so the community can, be can benefit as a whole. We all share, we all grow, and benefit as a result. Well, with traditional copyright licensing, this type of culture was coming into clash with the older model and it made it very difficult for artists to share freely and openly their music, their ideas, their um, poetry, what have you. So Creative Commons is a type of license where you can decide between different tiers of licensing. You can do Creative Commons where you just have to share alike. So if I create a piece of work and you use my piece of work in your piece of work, you have to agree to share your um, resulting work with the community. There's also sharing but with citation. So you can use my photo, but you have to cite the source. You just have to tell people where you got it from. There is also Creative Commons where you can only use it if you're mixing it and matching it. You can't use it in a standalone manner. And there are some Creative Commons licensee types that don't allow you to make money off it, some that do. So it's a couple of different tiers of Creative Commons licensing, but it was designed so that people can easily share with each other without having to jump through a lot of hoops, contacting lawyers, that kind of thing. You can learn more about Creative Commons by going to creativecommons.org. It's actually a really great website. It lists other websites that um, deal with Creative Commons licensing. So if you're looking for photos or if you're looking for videos that you can mix and match into your own work, you can go there first for inspiration and find out where you can go to find this licensed material. 
So these are the two types of artistic models, traditional copyright and Creative Commons copyright. If you use Creative Commons licensing, if you see the CC, please make sure you actually read the terms of the license because like I said, there are different tiers. So you do have to respect the terms of the license. Most Creative Commons um, Licensing is usually share alike or don't use in a standalone manner, which means you can't just download my photo and then sell that photo. You can use it in a PowerPoint, something along those natures. So please make sure you actually do read the restrictions of the license and please follow the restrictions of the license. This is how we're going to keep that um, material out there for the public to use. Let's talk about copyright and culture. So with the internet age, with the absolute availability of things to be ripped, shared, and downloaded, um, we've had a little bit of a clash of culture between those who want to benefit from the work that they've done and those who feel like just about anything that's artistic belongs to the community. It's all part of our greater culture and identity. So that's why the Creative Commons licensing was developed as kind of a nice little bridge between these two ideologies and it helps balance those two out in the new internet age. Traditional copyright has some ways to go before it catches up with the technology. Now the public library exists to kind of also act as a bridge and we've been around for generations. So we've been doing this for a while. The public library, academic libraries, we all depend on something called the first sale doctrine. In copyright law, the first sale doctrine allows you as a purchaser of a piece of work to sell it. Now this only applies to a specific copy that you bought. So if I buy a book, I have the right to sell or lend that particular book. This does not extend itself to licensing. So licensing is a little bit different because I do not own the material that I'm licensed, licensing. I um, have only access to it. So the company that is doing the licensing still is the owner of that particular copy. So the first sale doctrine is what allows public libraries to exist. We purchase individual books, DVDs, CDs, you name it to give to the general public for lending. As part of our negotiation, we negotiate licenses that allow us to give the public access to the materials. So we do a lot of negotiation, we do a lot of um, backflips to make sure that the public has their right to access um, available. So if you ever wonder what gives us that right to lend materials. It is the first sale doctrine. Interestingly, if you do Google first sale doctrine, the Department of Justice has written a great little couple paragraph essay about what it actually is intended for and what it is not intended for. Um, and it's just an interesting way of pointing out that when you purchase a physical object, it applies to that physical object that you purchased. It really is difficult to adapt it to the new internet digital age. So hopefully um, we'll see some changes soon on how the licensing could be adjusted. And this brings me to the most common question in the library. Why can't you help me download this? Why can't you help me copy this video? Why can't I make a copy of my CD? Why can't you help me photocopy this book? Each public library develops their own policy on how to handle copyright questions like these. So everyone's a little bit different, but basically I can give you the gist of it. We do our best to determine if the public is trying to use it for self-reflection, study, or any reason that would be considered fair use. And we help them to meet their fair use um, needs. We also try to best determine if it's something that is violating copyright law, and then we, we can't actually help you violate the law. You, I'm sure you can see why we can't do this. Um, so 
when you ask a librarian, can I copy a CD? Well, that is violation of copyright law. We can't make copies for the public for these materials. Um, if you ask, can I photocopy a book that I'm writing for my, like a little paragraph of a book that I'm writing for an essay for my teacher? Well, we might be able to help you do that. That might fall under fair use guidelines. And it really depends on the individual librarian or library to decide how they want to set up their policies to um, react to questions like these. At Twinsburg Public Library, we are more hands off. You are responsible for your own um, interaction with the materials. And if you come to us and ask us to help you, what we determine to be violating copyright law, we will say, no, we can't help you with that particular question. Um, so here's the gist. If it's open source free software or Creative Commons licensing, we'll definitely help you um, because that is designed for sharing. If you want um, a librarian to download a movie that hasn't been released yet from Universal Pictures or Disney or something like that, no, we cannot because that's making a copy of a material that we don't have the right to copy. And we have to be very careful when it comes to copyright law and follow the procedures in place. This particular image, if you're curious, and most of the images used in this PowerPoint come from a website called Morg Files. So you can actually search for Creative Commons licensed photos like this one. And this particular Creative Commons licensed photo did not require me to cite the source. And I was the only restriction I had was to not sell it in a standalone manner. So we can't help you download a movie um, and make a copy of it as long if it's not within public domain or if it's not Creative Commons licensing. But we do have apps available for you that you can access this material legally and free. That's part of our job is negotiating licenses so that you can access this material free and legal. So the, on the screen we see a couple of Twinsburg Public Library's apps. Other libraries have various apps. Um, we have Hoopla, which lets you stream or download DVD, um, movies from select publishers. You can also listen to audiobooks on Hoopla, listen to music CDs on Hoopla, and watch television shows. At the end of the term of checkout, the material will automatically vanish from your device. There's nothing that you have to worry about. It's just gone, and then you are never charged a late fee. Again, with Hoopla, everything is always available, so you never have to wait your turn. Overdrive is one of the oldest library apps, and this gives you access to ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and movies. Overdrive is your standard library style, so you do actually have to put things on hold and wait for them but it comes directly to your device. So you can read the books, you can listen to the audiobooks. There are no fines because at the end of your checkout period, the material will automatically vanish. You don't have to worry about it. And OverDrive, you can download this app onto multiple devices and pick up where you left off. So it remembers the page you were on, it remembers the chapter you were on, so that you can listen to your book or read your book or watch your movie um, on any device. We also have a subscription for Zinio, so this allows you to access some digital magazines. Zinio, um, once you check out the magazine, it's yours, and then you can choose to keep it on your device, or you can just delete it off your device and download it um, as you want to read it. It's up to you. The Cleveland Catalog, this is traditional library material, so this is a hard copy real world object. You can quickly access the catalog to find books. Not every book is available online. Not every piece of information is available online. I know it's a shocker to some people, but there are still a lot of materials out there that are only available in the old tree format. The Cleveland Catalog can help you find it. And if you can't find it through there, you can contact a librarian and we can find it for you um, through other means. We also have something called One Click Digital. One Click Digital is an app that gives you access to various audiobooks. There's little overlap between Hoopla, Overdrive, and one-click digital audiobooks. 
Um, so really, if you're an audiobook lover, you might want to have all three, and that will give you access to the greater number of audiobooks. All of these are free. There's no subscription prices. And anytime you want to learn them, there's a librarian who will be um, able to teach you how to use them. This material has been this material does not fall under first, uh, first sale doctrine because we do not own these physical copies, but we have negotiated the licensing to these digital copies so that you, the public, can also enjoy them. If you're curious about copyright, there's a great website, and I'm going to show it to you at the end of this PowerPoint, um, that will give you different tools for determining if your use of the material falls within the copyright um, guidelines. There's the public domain slider, which lets you know if a work is in the public domain yet. The fair use evaluator, which lets you know if you're using a material appropriately according to fair use. And a couple other tools. All of these tools are available on a website called librarycopyright.net. And if you click on resources, you'll see a couple of different tools that you can use to help you determine if copyright um, if you're applying your use for the material under the copyright guidelines. This is really great for educators. So if there's any educators out there, teachers, you might want to make use of this website, bookmark it for class. Really quickly, these are some of the resources I used to prepare for this um, webinar, including ALA Librarians as Creatures of Copyright. It's a good article, very in-depth about copyright and the library's role with copyright. The Creative Commons website, creativecommons.org, and the Copyright Office's um, website, which is copyright.gov. All these are excellent resources for you to continue your search for knowledge on copyright. Now, as promised, I'm going to quickly show you that website, copyright, uh, librarycopyright.net, and some of the tools. So librarycopyright.net, if you click on Resources, These are the different tools that you can use, especially if you're an educator, to determine if copyright um, guidelines are being followed. What I really like um, is the public domain slider, so if I click on this, I can use my mouse click and drag the little slider to determine if a work is possibly under public domain. Now this particular part of copyright law has changed a lot over the years so sometimes it can be a little difficult determining if a work fell under public domain. Pretty much everything before 1923 is public domain. But if you look at after 1922 and before 78 public domain public domain, and some of these have asterisks because there may be some issues with selected works. And I encourage you to look th through these tools and make use of them because they're great educational resources for determining copyright guidelines. There is a forum as well, so you can ask questions. You can talk with other members of the education community, different questions about how they've handled copyright restrictions. All right, I'm going to open it up now for questions, if there are any. All right, thank you very much for attending this quick webinar. And if you ever have any questions, you can contact us at 330-425 4268 or visit us at twinsburglibrary.org.